The sandwich is the most democratic of American dishes. No other nation took to the sandwich the way America did. But the sandwich actually owes its name to an 18th century British blue blood. Sir John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich, was a passionate gambler. One day, as the story goes, he got hungry in the middle of a card game. He didn't want to get his cards greasy, so he asked for a piece of meat between slabs of bread. The system worked, and the story got out and even crossed the Atlantic. Here in America, we experimented with the sandwich, and by the end of the 19th century, we could offer the world a truly original sandwich. It's peanut butter, of course, and it started out as healthy nutrition for adults. In fact, it's said that a doctor invented the stuff. Not, as everyone thinks, George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver did many good things, uh, and particularly with the peanut, but he didn't create peanut butter. Uh, we have good evidence that uh, a, a person, a doctor in St. Louis in 1890, uh, certainly was eating uh, peanut butter ground up. Actually, this good doctor created peanut butter as a way to feed protein to his elderly patients who had no teeth. Eventually, in the 1890s, John Kellogg, father of the cornflake, patented a way of making peanut butter and advertised it as a pasty adhesive substance. Certainly not an approach you'd think would ring up sales, but it did. As soon as you have peanut butter created, you have peanut butter sandwiches. And then the type of foods that are applied to peanut butter sandwiches multiply dramatically. So you have tomatoes and peanut butter. You have anchovies and peanut butter. You have liver and peanut butter. You have all these types of sandwiches that would sound god-awful today. Good news for sandwich eaters. Peanut butter and bacon became so popular that Oscar Mayer created a special spread with the two flavors mixed. Mmm, what a tantalizing flavor Oscar Mayer bacon gives to peanut butter. But one peanut butter combo created by some caring mother sometime before World War II took the prize. Good old peanut butter and jelly. Mom, can I have a sandwich? Then the government fed PB&J sandwiches to our soldiers. Loaded with protein, easy to store, ship and serve, Peanut butter helped the U.S. Army refute the old cliché that wars are won on meat. It stuck. Uh, and why it stuck, I can't tell you, other than the fact that as a child I loved it, and I'm sure most of the rest of us that had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches as kids loved it too. And it seems we still do. Americans eat an average of nearly three and a half pounds of peanut butter per person per year. That's 800 million pounds total, enough to smoothly coat the entire floor of the Grand Canyon. But whether it's with peanut butter or anything else, it takes a lot of work to feed sandwiches to a large family, what with all that cutting. That changed in the 1920s. And if you don't think it was a big deal, think of how often we rate something wonderful as the best thing since... Sliced bread revolutionized the sandwich world, and we owe it to an Iowa salesman named O.F. Rowetter, whose simple 1928 invention could slice a whole loaf in a few seconds. Sharp blades moving at great speed cut this bread into smooth slices. The time was right for another sandwich landmark, Wonder Bread. Come and get it, Tag. Plenty of Wonder Bread sandwiches today. The Taggart Company, which offered Wonder for the first time in the 1920s, said the name referred to the wondrous size of the bread. But this new loaf also boasted another wondrous attribute. Thanks to preservatives and a plastic wrapper, the bread would outlast your average fresh-baked loaf by several days. Authorities agree that the enrichment of bread has been a major factor in the greater vigor of our young people. And once the bread slices began humming, Wonder Bread was pre-sliced. The familiar polka-dotted package came to symbolize the American good life. Occasionally, white bread has been vilified for making the American sandwich a monotonous affair. In fact, the opposite may be true. The slicing of bread and the marketing of, of sliced bread uh, probably does encourage sandwich-like 
um, quick foods and any dish that comes out of uh, an ethnic cuisine or a foreign cuisine that can be turned into something sandwich-like becomes quite popular. Immigrants in cities that were only a few hours apart developed and claimed distinct specialty sandwiches. In Buffalo, home to many German immigrants, the official city sandwich is beef on weck. A slab of roast beef on a heavily salted roll with enough horseradish to make your eyes water. In Pittsburgh, the renowned local sandwich is served at Cremonti Brothers. But don't bother ordering fries and a side of slaw. In Pittsburgh, they're served right on the hand-sliced Italian bread. Back in the early 30s, Romani's restaurant was open from, say, midnight to 6 o'clock in the morning. And all the truckers would come in and drop off the produce. And they needed something to uh, eat real quick to take on the road. So legend has it that the Romani brothers put everything together on one sandwich, wrapped it up, and just gave it to the truckers that way so they can eat it on the road while they're traveling around. And in Chicago, they're known to pile spiced beef onto an Italian roll, then dip the whole thing into the beef juices and eat it dripping wet. American eaters are serious about variety, so if the sandwiches themselves aren't much different, no problem, we'll give them different names. Take the universally loved combination of salami and other cold cuts on a long Italian roll. That was originally called a grinder in New England because of the chewing it took to get through the crusty bread. But during the Second World War, deli owner Benedetto Capaldo in Groton, Connecticut, started shipping huge quantities of his grinder to the workers at the town's famous submarine factories along the river. The shipbuilders ordered more than 500 of them a day, so Capaldo started calling them submarine sandwiches in honor of his new clientele. In Pennsylvania, the sandwiches were named hoagies, a name believed to have been borrowed from Hog Island, another shipyard where workers ate the big Italian sandwiches. And in Louisiana, they were called Poor Boys, after a restaurant gave out free sandwiches to striking workers in 1929. And that's only the beginning. What about Zeppelins, torpedoes, rockets, heroes? I've vanished. But no matter where in America you are, no eatery is more closely linked to the sandwich than the deli. Delicatessens got their start on the East Coast in the waves of German and Jewish immigrants who came through Ellis Island. The delicatessen became a neighborhood fixture where these immigrants could find the delicacies of home, hence the name, delicat, the German word for delicacy, combined with essen, the word for eat. During the Great Depression, delicatessen owners literally banded together and started a campaign to convince Americans of other backgrounds to learn to eat delicatessen foods. The centerpiece of the delicatessen menu came to be sandwiches made from the cured meats, corned beef and pastrami, both common among the poor cultures of Europe. Corned beef is cured by soaking or injecting it with salt water. Then it's rubbed with garlic and cloves. It's boiled or steamed for the familiar, gentle flavor. Gonna need a side order, string beans with that omelet. Its cousin pastrami, the name is Yiddish, not Italian, is smoked before it's steamed and encrusted with ground pepper and other spices. Decided down. Please but one of the down. most famous deli sandwiches was invented in the 1930s. One Reuben, please, one Reuben. When deli man Arnold Reuben hit on a really distinctive combination. The original Reuben sandwich featured more than half a pound of meat, dripping with sauerkraut and melted cheese. It was served on giant slices of rye bread sliced extra thin. And people were willing to pay for the gastronomic event, a whopping five dollars. And before long, the sandwich was a national phenomenon. No question about it, most of America's favorite foods can be linked in one way or another to the sandwich. What makes a hot dog a hot dog, or a hamburger a hamburger? It's the sandwich treatment. And at a time when fewer and fewer Americans take time out for lunch, the sandwich, just as portable as it was in the days of the Earl of Sandwich, is still Lord of the Lunch Hour.